friends, friends of freedom. I'm not sure how I can follow uh, Daniel's speech there, and particularly the images of those evil people and the crimes that they committed. And Daniel, yes, as a former member of the European Parliament, I can tell you, I've had to sit in the room with Danuta Hubner yeah. and those communists. Oh, so you know her. Yeah. So I know her. I also know that the European Parliament has allowed, in its ranks as a member of the European Parliament, a member of Sinn Féin and the IRA, who is the wife of someone who tried to blow up Margaret Thatcher in Brighton, who's had communists who have come through as the Green Party, who are now attempting to change the language of our nation by brutally using children as their weapons of their next form of cultural destruction. So Dominic, you have given me great, great confidence and support here. But I also want to thank Kerry and John for inviting me here and yourselves as members of the American Freedom Alliance. The invite for me here is not only welcomed, and it's an honor for me to join so many people like yourselves who are fighting the battle of freedom, but it's necessary for us to meet. It is necessary for you to see people from 11 countries and three continents all fighting for the same things that you believe in. I mean, for after all, for the last three years, I campaigned for Brexit. I was a member. I tell you what, I wouldn't get that in some rooms. There'd be a little red dot on me as someone's trying to take me out, quite frankly. I've been fighting for 11 years for Brexit. I got elected in the European Parliament with UKIP under Nigel Farage in 2014. I drafted the immigration papers for them. I talked with Barry Bennett and Corey Lewandowski in the pre-Trump uh, being elected on how to deal with the immigration and the claims that were racists and xenophobes. I drafted the paper for Leave Means Leave. And now, for the last three years, we are being told that we can't leave the European Union. We're simply, as that song says, Hotel California. We can check in, but we can't check out. Well, I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm actually in a hotel in California, and I've checked in, and I'm not sure I want to get out. Have you seen the weather? Liberty, democracy, freedom. Those three words roll off the tongue so easily, yet society today forgets how hard those words were won by generations of the past sacrificing their lives for the future. As Ronald Reagan, the former United States President, once said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We did not pass it on in the children from our bloodstreams. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on to them for them to do exactly the same. And yet today, today, freedom is once again under attack. It's being curtailed. Freedom to practice one's religion is subverted to the religion of diversity. This time, its proponents are smarter, well-financed, well-connected, but they hide in plain sight professing to be liberals when they are clearly not. As Dominic mentioned, these liberals are simply the regrouping of Marxists and Trotskyists who, having lost, lost the battle for communism and its utopia in the Soviet Union and beyond, they needed another battle to fight the culture war. They cover their intent in the language of equality and diversity, and their current weapon of choice is immigration. Yet the liberal proponents of immigration are the traitors to the very words of freedom, liberty, and equality they profess to support. They say these words, but intend to kill its very spirit. They're like Donna Maria, the infamous Mayan traitor who sold out the Aztecs to the conquistadors and her lover, Hernando Cortez. For those of you who know the story, for those of you who don't. She acted as a translator, supposedly helping her own side in negotiations with this murderous 
attack on their own liberties and freedoms. But for the sake of sex and a future with Hernandez Cortez, who no doubt dumped her as soon as it was all done, she used language as a lie and was able to put the Aztecs not only into servitude, but eventually her own people were murdered. Immigration, of course, is a fraught word in the cultural war. It's a word that's been very craftily connected to racism, xenophobia, and used to label opponents like myself and those on this table here and those who are speaking at this conference as opponents of diversity and multiculturalism. Having spent the last 11 years in the campaign for Britain to leave the European Union, Brexit, and as I mentioned, the immigration papers, I have seen at first hand in the European Parliament how they're using the tactics by the liberal left on immigration and using legislation, education in the universities and schools, the media that they own and control as a whole, as fear to pursue their agenda. So I want to highlight some of those ways they're destroying the beauty of the phrases of diversity, equality, and in doing so, diminish our freedom. The first and most important method is the control of the language. As Dominic mentioned, we're called racists and xenophobes and populists, yet we should be calling them out for what they are, Stalinist, Marxist, Trotskyist, and anti-freedom. <laughs> we shouldn't be frightened to challenge them in the papers, on the newspapers, in the streets and the coffee bars for what they really are. Those people are the history of Hitler and Stalin and Mao. They are not the freedom fighters they profess to be. In the UK, the current scale of migration is enormous for our small country. Roughly 330,000 new migrants a year come to our country. Our population is expected to rise by over half a million every year. That's a city the size of Liverpool. And I'm from Manchester, and Liverpool was always our antithesis. But I, I do not want to see the size of Liverpool coming to our country every year. England's density is twice as crowded as that of Germany, three and a half times as crowded as France. We have 430 people per kilometer, square kilometer. It's a huge number. That's a lot less than you have here in California. Today, over 10 million people, or 15% of our population in the UK, were born abroad. Many of them coming from non-EU countries who don't share our culture and Judeo-Christian heritage. That is not to say that many of them don't support the very country that they've come to. When they do, like Priti Patel, our, for, our Home Secretary, they are pilloried by the left for being an Oreo, a coconut, or someone opposed to their race. Indeed, I had that in many speeches. Part Jewish, part black, part Irish, and part English, I was called those very names. I often wondered which part of me I'm supposed to chop off to throw back at them. But they use that to attack those. You will see that with Candace Owen. You will see those of the supporters of Blexit and supporting Trump. If you're black, you're supposed to be supporting the Democrats. If you're Puerto Rican, you're supposed to be supporting the Democrats. You're not allowed to think for yourself and believe that freedom is internally yours, not for theirs to grant to you. Open door migrationists say that the level of people coming into our countries are not important. In the UK, they firstly say that our nation has always been a nation of immigrants, and so we shouldn't be concerned about the numbers coming in. That is a palpable lie that I will use in my future book that's coming out at the end of December, where I've analyzed hundreds of pieces of research and academic papers. From the Romans to the Normans, yes, we've had them. The French Huguenots to the Irish, the Windrush, the beauty that they bring in culture too. But they are not part of our historical element enough to say that we are a nation of immigrants. The numbers were too small until the mid-1970s and 80s. In fact, if you look at the DNA of the British, to 70% of those born up to 1948 went back in our history for 6,000 years to the Brioths, the Vikings, the Celts, the Anglo-Saxons. It's only since people like Tony Blair opened the doors to mass migration in our country in the mid-1980s as our cultural shift changed so dramatic, dramatically, as I mentioned in those numbers. 
I will not stand by and allow the liberal left or their loony ideas to suggest that we are a nation of immigrants. We are a nation that welcomes immigrants. We are a nation that accepts the cultural bounds. We are friendly and warm and generous, but we will not allow them to destroy that with our idea that immigration, immigration, immigration for the sake of immigration. They say our economies would crash without mass migration. Yet, US Harvard, oh, and this one I love being a northerner. As an Englishman, you're too lazy to do the jobs. Well, I grew up on a working class estate in Manchester. My mum used to go and work in a shoe shop part time. She'd then work in the biscuit factory. And at night after I'd gone to bed, she'd go to the bookies, which is, I don't know if you have the same phrase here, and she would clean up with a brush to make sure that I had an education. That is a woman that worked, and she was the daughter of an Irish immigrant who worked. British people will work. They will work for a fair play, not the push down wages that you get from the mass corporates who like to have mass migration. <laughs> but the evidence for their arguments are false. Professor George Borges from Harvard University said the net economic amount that the United States could gain at the most was 10 billion. Oh, but then you've got to take in the cost of welfare, schools, and hospitals, which will probably make it negative. If you look in Holland, the Scientific Council, and I'm sure Thierry will know this over there, they have said that the net benefit of migration to Holland is negligible, if not nil. In the United Kingdom, our own migration committee recently said there was almost no net benefit to mass migration. But where they can show the evidence is the impact on the working poor and the poor of our countries. One of the first documents I got from the European Parliament when I entered was something they removed from the shelves within three months of me asking further questions on it. And that was when their research has showed that across Europe, mass migration pushed down the wages of those by up to 5% of those people suffering mass migration, particularly in the United Kingdom. Indeed, the Bank of England, prior to the referendum, suggested those who were cleaners, worked in nursing, those who were home helps, those who were builders suffered mass migration by having their wages cut and never rose as fast as those who happened to be funded by the European Union. Politicians, bankers, lawyers, accountants who all welcomed the European Union. Why? Because they could advise and charge large fees on it. Now, we know that that is not just the only thing that they will use against us, the language that we're xenophobes and racists. The language that you won't work, you're too lazy. The language we need them for our economy to survive. There is another reason that they do so, and that is to create division within our nation and also to strike fear into the hearts and the souls of people so that no longer challenge their ideas of diversity. That, I'm sure, is being covered here. But there is one other point. The diversity in immigration industry is absolutely enormous. In the UK, our own Human Rights Committee offers funding to over 600 groups across the country. Just before I left as a member of the European Parliament, I asked the Commissioner for Immigration, and Mr. Avram Malakoulis, I probably pronounced it incorrectly, but he then doesn't really recognize me very well, so I think the feeling's mutual between the two of us. What is the annual cost since 2007? The last two terms of immigration and migration to the <coughs> European Union. His response to me was, I don't know. <coughs> and I don't have time or energy or finance to find out the results for you. Take that from a man who receives up to half a million euros a year from the European taxpayer. He can't be bothered, doesn't have the time to find out what the real costs are. Well, in my report that will be published in the end of October, I've done his job for him. <laughs> Let me tell you that since 2007, the annual cost to the European Union alone, excluding some of its own countries, and when I come to Germany, it's extraordinary when they're paying 70 to 90 billion a year on immigration, is 50 to 60 billion euros a year annually since 2007. 2007. 50 to 60 billion billion euros a year
being spent on migration. And let me just give you a couple of examples of how they do that. That comes from my report. First of all, they will have a whole series of migration funds, about 20 in all. One is called the Asylum Migration and Integration Fund, AMIF. Just the odd sum of five billion a year being thrown into that. The European Asylum Support Office to help those who are supporting asylum seekers as they come in. Not the asylum seekers themselves, they'll get it from AMIF. These are the supporters, the charities, the NGOs, who will then often get in the region casually of around 456 million a year. Not bad if you want to earn a nice salary. Look at the salaries that the leaders own. They have integrated funds such as the security and borders and police funds, a second category of that. And within that, you can get Frontex. And Frontex itself has in the tune of around 1.5 billion a year. I could go on and on, and you'll get a chance to read that report where I've isolated every individual fund, but also the way that they're clever. They take funds that are not recognized to be about migration, like Horizon 2020, which is about education teaching our children of the future. They give up to a billion a year on that, so that in your universities, you have think tanks and professors putting out their ideology, their cultural ideas, that immigration should not be controlled, it should mass support it immigration, that the ideas that people are thick or stupid, that migrants are worth more than you, rather than recognizing that there are good migrants and bad migrants, there are those who will want to come to our country and work and be friendly with us. There are those who will want to rob and steal from you. The recognition that humans are different, that humans are not all the same, and that we should be supporting the ones whose values support ours and opposing those who we don't and being able to send back those that will not integrate in our countries, will not work in our countries, and will not live in our country's rules. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, friends, earlier I said that the battle for freedom of thought, speech, ideas, political beliefs has been lost in our schools, governments, charities and legislation. The Marxist ideology raids into the ownership of our souls of humanity continues. Attacks on the flags of independence, court cases or nation states like Poland for opposing the mass migration ideology. But I stand before you to say that all is not lost because for the past 10 years, have seen an absolute amazing fight back to grab the political landscape from the global elites, intent on ending national uni unity and nation states. I'm gonna take that phrase, Dominic, from what the Polish fought for 40 years to get their freedom, but it won't be 40 years for us to win our level of freedom back from those intent to destroy it. From electing your President Trump to voting for Brexit and leaving the European Union, the Gilets Jaunes challenging the globalist back Macron in the streets of Paris for 42 weeks, to Hong Kong, Venezuela, Brazil, Poland, Hungary. People have had enough. They've seen what the elites are doing. They want their freedom and they want it now, unadulterated, untouched and unfiltered. Here on this platform are seasoned and experienced messengers of freedom, daily challenging the opponents of liberty. Ms. Millier, a wonderful job he is doing in France, is he not? Being able to promote what's happening with Islam and its own fascism. Dominic, protecting the Polish borders and the special cultural hit heritage of Poland. And Katie, who you're gonna hear in a few moments, whose defense of freedom and common sense on our TV screens has led to death threats and vile abuse while well, she's facing them down as we all should. The foot soldiers of freedom are being replenished by the young at universities who are not ready to let the Marxist ideology that falsely pretends to exude freedom through diversity equality. New and energetic spokesmen are coming through, taking on that battle, like I've mentioned in Candace Owen. The arsenals of our battle are growing through organizations like yours, the American Freedom Alliance, PragerU with over a billion views on videos, and soon I will launch my own website for freedom and democracy. <laughs> the
The global attempt to suppress our freedom is ongoing, but the global fight back has only just begun. We will not let it win. We will fight, fight, fight until they are simply like the communists of the past, an element of history. Thank you.